Well, well. Well, well, well. Good evening, doctors. I uh, feel uh, rather out of my depth in uh, addressing such an associate, uh, association of uh, distinguished uh, loose cannon. <laughs> But in another sense, I, I, feel, I feel much at home that way because I've been rocking boats myself for quite some time. It does happen, and I think all of you uh, uh, experts will probably agree, that people who are innovative, people who are imaginative, people who are, uh, shall we say, uh, pioneers in their special fields are always somewhat out of place. They're always stepping on people's toes and uh, rocking boats. Well, so we are here, are here tonight with uh, an assembly of ex distinguished boat rockers, and I feel uh, very at ease and happy in, in, in speaking to you. <clears throat> the subject uh, is a little bit outlandish. Outlandish, at least for, uh, shall we say, the majority of academic types. The subject is a state of mind necessary to cope with a turbulent society. It's no surprise to any of you to realize that society is turbulent. It always has been. Whether it's any more or less turbulent now than has been in years past is debatable, and I don't feel qualified to go into that. The point is that we do live in a society in which physical violence is commonplace. Now that may be deplorable, perhaps it's not. However, we do live there and we are faced with a situation in which personal defense, personal well-being of the individual and his family and his property uh, are his business. It's all very well to call 9-11, but uh, it takes a while to get there. So the thing is, what do we do about that? How can we handle that? Well, I have been a professor of uh, weapon craft now for longer than I like to think. And during that period, it has been my fortune to develop uh, philosophies concerning this because the area was more or less untouched. If, unless you were a specialist in such things, you will probably be surprised to find that the methods of using uh, firearms are not age old. They have been developing and evolving uh, while we watch. And a lot of it's been done right here in Southern California over the past three decades. Now whether that's uh, worldwide or not depends upon what book you're reading. But the fact is that we do know a lot more about it than we did at, say, at the close of World War II. It isn't that people haven't been shooting, but they haven't been shooting awfully well. Now, is this a good or a bad thing? I'm sure you all are reasonably familiar with that Chinese fire drill we had up at uh, Laurel Canyon here in <coughs> North Hollywood. Um, 800 rounds fired <laughs> with a couple of casualties. Now, what's, what's going on there? Uh, what problems uh, can we face? The problem is not technical. It's not a matter of marksmanship. It's a sociological problem. And uh, with that in mind, we can take the notion of technique and put it to one side. Now, over the decades, uh, I and associates of mine have evolved ways of teaching people to use sidearms very efficiently. But the question is uh, whether that matters or not. When you have a case where you have an easy target at close range, uh, what good is marksmanship? Do you need it? Does it matter? An example, not too long ago in uh, West Los Angeles, a young couple were beset by a goblin on the second deck of their apartment who pushed them in through their open door and proceeded uh, about his business of assault and robbery and so on. And to start with, he uh, ordered the young man 
to lie down on the floor and put his hands behind him so he could tie them. Well, he more or less disregarded the girl, and then he had to do something with the gun, you know. You can't tie a man's hands with a gun in your hand. So he put the pistol in his belt, and while he knelt behind this young man to tie his hands with something in mind in the future, I suppose, this girl just lifted the gun out of his belt and killed him with it. <laughs> now, <laughs> when the muzzle is touching the target, uh, marksmanship is really not all that critical. <laughs> so we, uh, we happen on this. How is it that that girl did that job the way she did? And I can give you many other examples. I have uh, dozens, maybe scores in my own personal experience. Uh, but <clears throat> why does it happen that when she did that and these others did so well, why is it that these other people do so badly? There's a critical difference here, isn't there? Why is it that um, some people do well under conditions of violence and some people do very poorly? And it is not a question of marksmanship skill, at least not basically. Now, you take those uh, poor fellows up there in North Hollywood two, three or three months ago, and I dare say that any one of them could have easily hit a uh, Coke bottle over there on that counter from where I'm standing. And yet they fired and fired and fired and fired and missed and missed and missed. And the question comes to why? Why is it that they hit on paper targets but they didn't hit in a fight? Well, this again, as I insist, is not a matter of physical technique. It's not a matter of what size gun. It's not a matter of how much training. Immediately after that fiasco, a whole number of uh, newspaper correspondents were busily uh, saying that, well, the Los Angeles Police Department uh, were outgunned. The, Las Pas the LA Police Department was, needed more training. They needed larger calibers. Uh, I submit that that isn't the point at all. Uh, it's a philosophy of ours, teaching this matter for several generations, that you are outgunned only if you miss. <laughs> So whether the other guy has 14 shots available or whether he has full automatic fire available or whether he has a larger caliber is not important if you don't miss him. <coughs> so the thing is, how do we attack this problem? Well, it's not as simple as it sounds. It's all very well to say, well, uh, how can we expect a man to uh, keep his head when somebody's trying to kill him? And the answer is, don't make that too difficult. People do that all the time. It's not that hard. Accurately, it's easy. And for a, an individual to say, well, I couldn't be careful, I couldn't watch what I was doing because I was scared, say, unacceptable. On the other hand, you have to consider what personality you're addressing. Who is, who is it we're talking about? Well, let's divide your shooters into categories. Uh, let's talk about, first of all, the uh, law enforcement and then talk about the military, and then talk about the private citizen. Now there are those in the world, and I needn't point any fingers, who insist upon the fact that, uh, as they put it, civilians, in quote, uh, should not have firearms. Well, uh, they get that wrong because, of course, a police officer is a civilian. You can look that up if you want. But the fact is, what they mean is that a person who is not part of the public establishment should not be armed. Well, I can point out that the only people who use firearms well, in large measure, are people who are not in the public establishment. Because to be handy with a firearm, you have to like it. There has to be a desire. There has to be a, uh, a will. And this has been very obvious to me for many, many years, because when you grab a man off the street and put him in a, in a blue suit and say, now you are X, Y, or Z, be, be so, that doesn't happen. He has to want to do that. Now, I'm not suggesting that police officers can't shoot because many of the best shots in the world are police officers. But they were police officers, they were good shots before they became police officers. <laughs> the same thing is true of the military. Uh, I'm not putting myself up as an example, but I got into the military because I like to shoot, not the other way around. 
They didn't teach me how to shoot after I got into my uniform. Well, I got into my uniform because I thought I'd get a lot of ammunition. <laughs> so we have a, a situation here as to who is going to do well under conditions of, of, uh, of conflict. Who is going to handle it well? Who is going to keep his head? It's not, I repeat, very hard. There are only a couple of small principles you have to remember when somebody's trying to kill you. And that is concentrate on the use of your firearm. Just two things. Those of you who have been to school uh, realize those two things are your front sight and your trigger control. That's all. You can't think about anything else. You have to be sure that you're not letting anything distract you. Now, you say, well, the man's trying to shoot me. That distracts me. I say, blank it out. Don't let that happen. Now, I don't speak from theory. I have now well over 50 cases of students of mine who, after having been trained, have, as we say, met the elephant. And not one of those people has told me after that, after a successful outcome, that he did so because he was a particularly good shot. He said, I won that fight because I was thinking the way you taught me to think. And that is the answer. The combat mindset, which we use as a title for this presentation this evening, is the whole thing. You have to have the right state of mind and you have to be prepared for it. Now, that's not uh, as easy to accomplish as it is to, to suggest. Uh, not everybody has the, the state of mind to face up to lethal violence. Most people are astonished when, they, when it comes to them. And yet, they shouldn't be. If they read the newspapers, if they look at the television, they know that this happens all the time. So why should they be astonished? So what we try to do in teaching people to handle this problem is to remember that it can come to you, and it can come to you now. So that when it does come, instead of saying, oh my God, my life's in danger, I'm going to go blind. You say, I thought this would happen, and I know what to do. And of course, the answer to uh, lethal violence, the threat of lethal violence, is counter-violence. This goes contrary to what a number of the kinder and gentler people would have you believe, but it uh, is nonetheless a fact. When somebody offers you, or those near to you, or those innocents, deadly force, your proper answer is immediate counterforce, right then before he's ready. You'd be astonished to see how often when a, 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 a felon, a, a predator, a, a goblin, when he offers lethal violence to a private citizen, how shocked he is when he's resisted. It throws him completely off. <laughs> it's amazing. We have this, in many cases, on tape of these closed circuit television things in liquor stores. When a man comes in and says, all right, get your hands up, this is a stick up, and somebody says, bang, he says, hey, you, you don't understand. <laughs> and then he falls down. <laughs> the mental problem, you see, takes care of the physical one. It's not a question of, of what brilliant speed. But in, in competition, we work on speed, and we try to teach people to shoot very, very quickly and very well, and the champions do. But again, the mental response is the thing. It's not a matter of a split second. It's a matter of doing the right thing at the right time. And it's, uh, well, I suppose it's not a very funny thing, but it is kind of amusing to see the way in which people, violent criminals, respond when they are not, um, uh, when, that, when people don't do what they say. We find from closed circuits and other responses that uh, the immediate response on the part of a, a violent felon when he is not obeyed is to repeat his order. We see that all the time. He comes in and says, all right, everybody lay down on the floor. And then they don't. He says, hey, you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> How long did it take me to say that? About three seconds? Well, you can undo his shoes in that length of time. <laughs> Providing your mind is set that way. Now, uh, the answer is, well, I can't live like that. I can't go through life expecting uh, deadly force to come through that door. And they, of course, that is too much. We live too often in a condition which is not suitable for that. 
On the other hand, we should be prepared to face that eventuality if it does come. And one of the best ways to do that is to study in your own mind, your, own, your mindset at any given time on the what-if basis. We used to teach junior officers in infantry, for example, what would you do if they showed up over that ridge? What would you do if this started over here? What if? Well, it's kind of a good game for the private citizen to play. What if? What would I do if this happened? What would I do if that happened? What if this turned in that way? And then you say, well, this is what I would do. And then if you just play that game once in a while, in your spare time, while you're uh, driving to work or so on, you get to the point that when it does happen to you, it doesn't surprise you. And that is the aim, that's the purpose, to set yourself in a condition in which you uh, are not surprised. And I repeat saying, not, my God, I can't believe this, but I, did, I do believe this, I know it's happened, and I know what to do about it. And that's the issue. That's the whole point of the exercise. The uh, idea of how to, how to get people to where they can control themselves that way. Now, what happens with these uh, disasters? And this one up in North Hollywood was just one. We have many of them. I don't like to jeer at my friends in the police departments because it sounds as if I were picking them out and jeering at them on purpose, but I just want to point out that it's unnecessary. We have a ghastly tape over in Arizona, happened just last year, where uh, there was a bad guy who committed some bad things and ran off and tried to make an issue of it. And the uh, highway patrol ran him down. And on the tape, we have pictures of this man standing there by his car shooting at the camera while bullets are hitting the ground around his feet. Now, why is that? Why is it that those uh, highway patrolmen were using their weapons that way? Well, I think one of the things we have to face is the fact is the, <clears throat> is the uh, personnel problem we have, which is very severe. Now, if we say military, private citizen, police officer, we look at it from three different directions, don't we? The soldier the volunteers for the army. He gets into that, and what he's going to do about fighting is pretty much off to one side. The modern infantryman is, is not particularly excited about using his personal weapon as a general thing. And uh, we have to make some way, uh, aware, make him aware of the fact that it does matter. It can be done, but the uh, stimulus must be provided to him from outside. He must be taught by his superiors, his, teacher, his teachers, his trainers, why he should want these things. Well, that's a, a special subject, and we don't have many people in the military anyway uh, in that condition, so I won't stay with it. But the next thing we get to is the, so is the policeman. Now, the problem we have today, which is, I won't say it's inter insurmountable, because no problem is insurmountable, but we have a dreadful problem with personnel. Ask any chief of police. He'll tell you, it print private, what am I going to do with these people? And to try to teach those people uh, to uh, develop a warrior mentality is a, uh, it's a bad one. It's tough, really tough. We had a situation happened, was it, uh, about 10 days ago. Uh, this was somewhere in the Midwest where these two people made an arrest, both in uniform, police officers. And this uh, bad guy they had uh, uh, confronted, they wanted to make a forcible arrest. And so the uh, uh, man in charge told him to get down on his face and so the, the girl over here had to cover him with her pistol. Well, she stood over there with her pistol in both hands, pointing right at his head while the suspect was on his face and the, and the other policeman was trying to get handcuffs on him. Well, while the policeman was trying to put handcuffs on this suspect and the girl over here was pointing this pistol at his head, uh, she let one go. Missed. <laughs> she was aimed in on his head at a distance of about six feet and she missed. Well, believe me, that shook everybody up. The suspect went bananas because they're trying to kill me. And she went bananas because this gun went off in her hand. And the officer trying to shake, handcuff this boy was going bananas too because what do I do about this now? And the whole situation went right up in smoke. 
Now, the question is, uh, what are those people doing in those suits? <laughs> what are they wearing those suits for? Can we change that? <clears throat> well, it's a big order. If we don't ask uh, the proper levels in law enforcement uniforms, we are, we're in difficulty trying to make, train people. Wasn't it uh, Bill Clinton who said he was going to put 100,000 more policemen on the street? <laughs> Where are you going to get 100,000 policemen? Money won't do it. When you think about it, to be a good cop takes more than almost any occupation you can name. To be a good cop, a man in the first place has to be strong, fast, alert, and in good condition. He has to be able to handle himself well. He has to have command presence. He has to drive a car well enough to compete in formal rallies. He should be a good shot. He must know the law. He must present a good appearance, and he must be honest. You're going to get 100,000 like that? <laughs> so I'm not going to say that uh, we, th this problem is easy, but as long as we r uh, forget that to be a police officer uh, calls for a set of qualifications which are difficult and hard to assem assemble in one man, we're going to be faced with this one. But whether we... <laughs> Whether we care about it or not is another matter. Does it matter? Well, uh, in general, the police win gunfights. Not always, but if they win them most of the time, I guess that's enough. But we certainly do have a body of doctrine which is, uh, can stand improvement. Now, as far as the private citizen goes, now we're getting somewhere. Because a private citizen is not going to put himself out to learn weapon craft unless he wants to. I mean, that's obvious, isn't it? If he goes to a school or a training organization, he must put out the money, take the time, and develop himself. Now, there is where you get good qualifications. And that's the reason why it exasperates me to hear people say, well, those people shouldn't have firearms. We should only give firearms to the incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> this. Um, is a, is a difficult one. It's worldwide, not just here. In Europe, uh, it's very widespread. Only the man in the gray suit should have uh, access to a firearm. Uh, what that means, of course, is that um, <clears throat> it gives the street over to the, the goblin. And I'm interested to see how that's going to develop in such places as England and Australia and Canada recently, where they've decided to give the street to the hoodlum. And they've made it law. So we can see what happens now. Conversely, in this country, we discover that those places where firearms are made more easily available to the individual, crime rates have shown uh, a distinct change. They've gone down. The, uh, there are different kinds of crimes, of course. Pa crime passion in the home are one thing, totally different from armed robbery on the street, and uh, that different in itself from gang gangland shootings. But we find that in most cases, <laughs> The, uh, especially the armed robbery on the street, that in those states where uh, legal concealed carry is now the rule, that crime has taken, I won't say a disastrous step downward, but it's gone down. We're talking about 10, 12, 15 percent down in states with a pioneer state of Florida and coming on with others. So where, where now anyone who is a, a decent citizen can be authorized to carry his own firearm. The issue is, um, how good is he with it? A firearm is not as complicated as a, as a musical instrument. You don't have to be a flute player to shoot a pistol well. But you can't be just a klutz. I mean, you have to know which end the bullet comes out. <laughs> and consequently, we have to set up a system, or most states have done this, to assure that people who are permitted or licensed to carry weapons, uh, whether that's a legitimate situation for government is another matter, but are, they do make it that way. Uh, in those places, <clears throat> uh, how do we get teachers to teach those people? It uh, is fairly comical in my state, Arizona, because they decided, well, you can't get a permit in Arizona unless you establish the fact that you can control this gun. And I said, how do you do that? Well, you've got to be examined. Who examines you? A hundred thousand teachers? <laughs> well, what it amounts to is it's pretty much a matter of just waving you through. I'm not trying to knock this. I think it's better than it was before. 
but does break away the issue. If you expect the man who carries a pistol to be an expert, you've got to make sure that he wants to be an expert. And he has to have some sort of uh, incentive to get there. So um, we have this uh, triple problem. Do we need to make soldiers good? And if we do, how do we go about it? Do we need to make police officers good? And if we do need to make them good, how do we do that? The final answer, of course, is if we need to make private citizens good, we can, because we have a number of establishments throughout the country where that can be done. The only issue is it's very small, minute. I would say, uh, considering the number of institutions, the number of applicants, the number of students, we're talking about a few thousand people a year in a population of two and a half, 250 million. So we have a, a long road to hoe here. But the important thing to remember is that competence in self-defense is not so much a matter of equipment or a matter of training. It's a matter of desire. I suppose that's an obvious thing. But the more I work with it, the more I see it. And uh, it's, it's only the man who wants to be able to do it who will set himself up to try. So, set is what does it. And that can be imparted. I know it can be because I've done it. I've done it for 30 years now. And uh, those who can find places where they can be taught. If this interests you, I, I can tell you more about it. But I'm just saying that that's what it takes. You can't just say, <clears throat> I give up. You can fight back. And you can maintain your dignity, which is, of course, more important than your life. Thank you. <laughs> Gotta get unhooked. That's it. <laughs> yeah, if uh, if you want to ask, ask questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Keep in mind that my hearing is not what it might be. Uh, I've been shooting a lot, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so when you ask a question, I will ask some. If I can't hear it clearly, I'll ask somebody to relay it to me. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, there is, uh, many of the physicians in this room are members of an organization called the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, and many of them probably would support your viewpoint on these issues. There's a more obscure rival organization called the American Medical Association, <laughs> which has less uh, intelligence but more members than we have. And they regularly publish articles to wit that guns are dangerous in the home because there are many more accidents with guns and more harm is done with guns than the good that might be done by guns used for self-defense or frustrating crime and therefore physicians should oppose home ownership of guns. Um, what are the facts in this? Are more guns used um, for harm or for accidents than uh, used for good? I can give you uh, about 18 different sets of statistics on that. Uh, the people who want to take the wrong view simply falsify. You know, a, you people are enough scientifically inclined to realize that statistics can be used any way you want. You ask this question, you get this answer. Uh, no, I don't think you can make a case for that, although I've seen it published often and often, and the AMA carries a certain amount of weight in certain places, and they say, well, you see, a, a gun in the home is most likely to cause death in the home than it is to repel borders. All right, I will not accept that, A. In the first place, I don't believe it's true. I believe my statistics are better than those. But in the second place, I don't think it really matters. Because we're not talking about numbers here, we're talking about individual dignity. And it's more important to what happens to you than what happens in two out of three cases. So to say that uh, firearms accidents in the home are uh, an epidemic. I think it's been advertised that way, uh, as a, you know, a medical problem. Uh, well, if it is, it's the wrong problem to attack. A firearm in the home is, of course, a uh, tradition that goes back prior to 
uh, our American society. It's part of, Amer of the American heritage, but it goes back before that. Does a man have a right to stand up in the face of lethal violence and protect himself? Well, anyone who says he doesn't just doesn't know any history. He doesn't know where we are. He doesn't know how we got here. So if there's one case in which this handles, handles it right, it's more important than the fact that there are several cases where it might not, even though that might not be the rule. To repeat, I am not going to accept the fact that these, this matter of accidents in the home is a plague. It doesn't work out that way. There are very few of those. And whoever lists them is listing them on the wrong, wrong attitude. They take uh, all sorts of uh, sideline issues. <laughs> issuing for, for the fact that the young people are more apt to be involved in firearms violence and then when they, they include the, the ghetto punks as children because they're under 21. They doctor their statistics that way. And uh, so I, uh, I can't just stand up here and t tell the American Medical Association to go flat kite, but that's my, my inclination. <laughs> Another one, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, my Washington driver's license is valid in California, but my carry permit probably isn't and isn't in most uh, other states, and yet the Constitution says that states shall give full faith and credit to other states' laws. Have you uh, looked into this very much or thought about it, or just do you just look with it? Uh, have I thought about what question exactly? My carry permit from Washington State is not valid here in California. Mm -hmm. But why isn't it? I see. The uh, matter of why isn't your permission in one state good in another? Yeah. Yeah, that's reciprocity and it's being pushed now. You can't, for instance, pass a law about that <clears throat> under the Constitution, under the Tenth Amendment, because it's not a federal matter. On the other hand, you can pass a law saying it's a good idea for State A to honor the, paper, the uh, certification of State B, and that's reciprocity, <laughs> and we're working on it. It's, the it's, Constitution says that every state has to give full faith and credit to the laws of other states. Yeah, and uh, uh, it should hold. It, uh, whether it does or not depends on which state. And of course, uh, whether people pay attention to the Constitution, it depends upon time and place, doesn't it? Uh, the Constitution says that if the Constitution itself, the body, does not authorize a certain act, that the federal government can't do it. That's the Tenth Amendment. And people have paid no attention to the Tenth Amendment since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. If you bring up the Tenth Amendment in Washington, they laugh at you. Social Security, for example, who says that the federal government is authorized to get into the insurance business? Certainly not the Constitution. So when we, when we plead constitutionality, which you have done, sir, and done very well, I'm saying you're right. But uh, if the people don't want to obey those laws, uh, who does what? And we're getting into a very delicate situation now. If the government doesn't obey its own laws, who disciplines the government? Now you can say, well, we can vote. Yeah, we can vote if we will. But suppose they don't like the way we vote. What happens then? We're getting into a very delicate situation here, and I uh, don't like the looks of it at all. I think it's probably that the great majority of the American people are so apathetic that they don't care whether we follow our own Constitution. I feel strongly about the Constitution, but I would go one step further and say the Constitution isn't the origin of uh, the Bill of Rights. As it says in the Bill of Rights, that. All men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are. It doesn't say the state does that. These rights are given not by the state, but by the creator. And if you don't believe in God, you're in tough trouble. <laughs> um, our entertainment channel, I believe, had a special on the history of the gun. A while back. And one of the fascinating things I found was they talked about how the American Revolutionary War soldier was absolutely feared in many cases by the British soldier because they had been carrying a gun since they could carry a gun. And they were crack shots. And when the British couldn't hit the Americans, the Americans could knock off the British at one to 200 yards. 
And do you have any other details about the superior marksmanship, uh, weapon handling capability of the American soldier from you know First World War, Second World War, up to present day? Sure. Because of the fact that you know, like me, since I've been five years old, I've been going out every weekend and shooting yeah. with that. Do you have any other details, or is that still carrying over and true in our current well, armed forces? Don't tempt me. I may go on all night. <laughs> Seriously, I, 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 I hear you talking, and uh, the best answer I can give, of course, is that a man is more dangerous if he can use his weapon well. And who is likely to be able to use his weapon well? A uh, farmer who spent his, kid, his childhood uh, shooting squirrels in the back lot? Or a man who was grabbed off the streets of a big city and told to be a soldier? Uh, I hear too often, you say, well, he was, a, or he was a civilian, a private citizen. He was not a trained soldier. And I say... Yeah, who's a trained soldier? Boy, I've got some good examples of that, and as I say, I could go on and on. You talk about, do Americans shoot well? Do they shoot better than the British? Well, they certainly did in the Revolutionary War. Please give a good example. Give one good example for us. All right, I can give you the case, the, uh, uh, again, if, forgive me for jumping all of our borders, I, and I, I'll go to South Africa, and the Battle of Majuba Hill, in which the British Redcoats were attacking a bunch of farmers, not soldiers. The Boers were not soldiers, they were farmers. And uh, they called themselves that, Boer means farmer. And the, uh, the uh, British officers, uh, when the war began, said, well, you don't believe that these, these unlettered, uh, unwashed, uh, uneducated uh, farmers are gonna be able to stand up to these redcoats? The answer is, well, we won't stand up to you, we'll just shoot you. <laughs> Now, whether that matters today or not is um, uh, problematical because uh, to, in today's uh, battle scenes, we don't have many cases. But keep in mind that very recently, the private citizen in his own land with his own gun, Afghanistan, Chechnya, the private citizen with his own gun is a guy that makes the, that makes the, cop, makes the uh, authorities frightened. A, a, an armed citizenry cannot be terrorized. They cannot be tyrannized. It won't, they won't go. You can't come in there and say, well, we're the government. They say, well, forget it, mister. You don't convince me. And this has been true for a long time and it will apparently continue to be true because it's all, all very well to say that uh, the individual cannot send up against a tank or a helicopter, but they're doing it. And not 100 years ago, but just today while we watch. Uh, you can't discipline people who refuse to be disciplined. And uh, if the majority of people don't want to go along with that, it doesn't matter how many soldiers you've got. I've read that in the last 30 years, the number of federal officers who are empowered to carry weapons has increased by several orders of magnitude. It's gone from a very small number to a quite substantial number. And increasingly, they are being militarized in the sense of becoming paramilitary SWAT team type units. Does this increasing militarization of federal law enforcement concern you, and why, and what can be done about it? Thank you. Uh, a very pungent question. I don't know how many um, spies we have in the audience, <laughs> but I will say that this very point you mentioned the militarization of people who should not be properly military. We call them now the ninja, the guys in the black suits. Uh, well, one thing we see about them, which is most interesting, is that they're so scared. When the ninja want to put the slam on somebody, instead of coming up and knocking on his door, they show up with a rifle company to take care of two guys. That suggests they're afraid, doesn't it? Does to me. I'm talking in what might be called a subversive fashion now, but I'm not. I'm talking about liberty, which is what this country is about. And when they start putting, well, in some cases, incompetent feds in black suits, in helicopters, and giving them their own air force. You know the BATF has its own air force now? Uh, against what? Against the enemy. Well, who is the enemy? We are. We are. Bubba. 
You know, uh, the, I, when we haven't got a, a, a war anymore, in the sense of the way we had lined up against the Russians for so long, uh, who is the enemy now? Well, we've got the Chinese menace over there on the other side, as you heard about today. Very serious matter. But as far as I understand it, the uh, young soldiers today are given the impression that maybe Bubba is the enemy. And uh, that's a, an increasing polarization, which uh, of course makes everybody very, very uneasy. Very uneasy. The last thing in the world you want to do is to say, I would, I would resist my own government. But the question comes back, what happens when my own government doesn't, that pays no attention with its own rules? Uh, the Constitution authorizes a militia. Do you know any place in the, in the Constitution where it authorizes a federal police force? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Those uh, federal agencies uh, may stop into a doctor's office to seize important contraband like medical records. And one doctor in uh, West Virginia had 30 agents storm into his office, line the patients up against the wall, their backs turned, point their guns at him. Three of them pointed guns at his nine-year-old son. Well, what agencies were involved, I asked. He said, well, the FBI and the DEA and the um, Office of Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services and the Post Office yeah. <laughs> were all making raids on his office. So just following up to the gentleman's question before. I wanted to put in a plug for the Medical Sentinel, which is the, the journal of the Association of, of American Physicians and Surgeons, a follow-up to Dr. McAfee's comments. The AMA certainly is very much on the gun control bandwagon, along with the Centers for Disease Control and so on. Um, this organization started out as kind of a reaction to Physicians for Social Responsibility, which were against American self-defense. And, and looked upon nuclear weapons as being like germs. Well, now guns in the hands of any American citizen are, have kind of taken that over. And there's all kinds of misuse of statistics to, to bring the case that you know citizens can't be trusted with guns. The Medical Sentinel does try to counter this misinformation with good analysis of these statistics. The editor is Dr. Miguel Faria, who was born in Cuba and kind of knows something about Agent of governments which have strict gun control. He was fired as editor of the Medical Association of Georgia probably because of his stand on gun control. So if you want a counter to the AMA journal, please uh, find out about getting a subscription to the Medical Sentinel. But the question I had to ask for you is when, when these people say, well, these guns are dangerous, well, of course they're not only dangerous, they're deadly. And they propose measures like, well, you ought to keep your gun locked up and your ammunition someplace else, where of course it makes it absolutely useless to you. Maybe you have some advice to counter with on what you do about how to uh, counteract the dangers of having a gun? Well, obviously we have to be able to conduct our own affairs in our own homes as we wish. And to make some rule to the effect that you have to have a, a trigger lock on your, on your firearm is complete and utter foolishness. It's mainly, a, it has a lot of support from the people who make trigger locks. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the uh, notion that you can make a weapon perfectly safe is, of course, ridiculous. It's not supposed to be safe. As the uh, Russian translator said, he's gone. He's not safe. Yeah. So uh, safety is a, another matter entirely. It's not a matter of equipment. It's a matter of, of, of mind. Uh, no weapon is any more or less dangerous than any other. They're the same. And this is, of course, it is most annoying to have people say, well, we should have this kind of a gun, but not that kind of a gun doesn't make any difference. Any gun will do. If I want to do something felonious, I can do it very well with a 22 single shot. I don't need an AK-47. And so the, the whole issue is to get off the subject of the type of equipment and onto the act. We ought to have rules against acts rather than equipment. I uh, am delighted to say that they have really good gun laws in Bolivia. They don't have any. <laughs> they do have laws against murder, against armed robbery, against assault, against all sorts of things, but they don't have any rules against guns because guns don't do anything. It would be, this would be obvious to anybody except a liberal, wouldn't it? <laughs> Jeff, uh, you talked about uh, officers, police officers should be trained to use the use of their guns as well. Uh, I have a question to you since you've seen so much of this. Uh, what do you think about this as uh, the officers 
perhaps not understanding how guns work and how people treat them. What do you think of the possibilities that a man who has two guns in his home, two handguns in his home, uh, going off and finding a third gun, untraceable, 1913, made up the parts of two different guns, uh, going over to a park and uh, putting this gun in his mouth uh, with his both hands over the cylinder, pulling the trigger with a thumb, and the leaving no uh, no trace, no bullet being found, the no blood uh, being found on the vegetation around visible around the body, no trickle of blood coming out of the corner of one mouth, um, and then uh, concluding that this man committed suicide. Does that sound like uh, the police officers have a good idea? They said such an obvious suicide. But they wouldn't investigate it as a possible homicide. Do you think that's all? Like There's no question that? about that. We all know the case you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that is not. Uh, it, it, now, any stretch of the imagination of suicide, it, insofar as I know what happened at all, it is, of course, a murder. The question is who did it? Not a question of whether it was a murder, but who committed the murder? And we're apparently not going to pay any attention to that because we're. It's swept under the rug. But what can we do about getting, I mean, every, everybody realizes this, and yet the, the world seems to accept the idea that the, these incompetent, untrained, the officer who made that determination had never investigated this kind of death before. He was given, he was given the assignment because he needed some on, on, uh, hands-on training, they said. Now, you know, what can we do about this to wake people up to the fact that there's something smelly about this? What we can do... Everybody I... doesn't know. We're talking about Vince Scott. Sure, sure. We know what you're talking about. And when you say, what can be done about it, uh, we can start a revolution, of course. Uh, I, I'll ask a, a counter question here. How many in this room have read the book called Unintended Consequences? One, two, three, four. Yeah, that's by Ross. That, that's the forbidden book. And uh, I uh, am not advocating that you read it. I'm just saying that this author proposed what we can do. And it's not pretty reading. Who's the author? Ross. Ross. James Ross. Unintended Consequences. It has many things wrong with it. It has a lot of technical errors. And it's, it's, la it's lashed through with uh, what I would call kinky pornography, which is unnecessary. But it does put an issue. What are we going to do about this when the government doesn't obey its own laws? Uh, part of the funding for the crime bill that you mentioned uh, went to the police department of the town of Rolling Meadows, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And the funding, uh, uh, the grant came down saying that it was to be used for funding to train the Rolling Meadows Police Department on how to coordinate with the military and military operations in Rolling Meadows, Illinois. I'm wondering if you have any information pertaining to how the rest of the funds are being spent in the United States or whether you've heard of any other similar instances. Well, I sort of don't have that information. I don't know what the fund's being raised for. And I don't have a great deal of confidence in the, in the way they would, because I don't have any great belief in the competence of our instructors to, do, to, to train these people. Say, so we'll train all these police officers, but I don't know that they know what to train them in. Again, I'm not trying to knock the whole department. Some of my best friends are cops, and some of them are excellent. Some of them are even very good shots. But the majority is difficult, especially when you can't make any discrimination. See? In order to pick out a, a good cop, you've got to discriminate, don't you? I mean, that's what your mind is for. This man is better than that man. That's the one I want. But if I say that immediately, I'm in political trouble. Uh, if I may ask also, if, do you know of any guns that any gun control law has ever controlled? No. <laughs> no, I don't. I sure don't. I never heard of a gun that did anything by itself. Mr. Cooper, there are a lot of jurisdictions that uh, limit or prohibit the ownership of guns. I'm from Canada, and they have a philosophy up there that uh, they don't want you to protect yourself. Well, this is not acceptable to me, but I want to know what you would do 
you personally would do in a situation where the handguns are illegal, they are registering all of the firearms, you can't take a gun, you can't legally take a gun out now unless it's locked in your trunk and there's a trigger lock in the gun. I'm not talking about handguns. Yeah. I'm talking about rifles. two rifles or a shotgun or anything. What would you personally do or recommend in this kind of a situation? First, uh, what part of Canada? BC. Yeah. Well, you see, Canada should be altered. They should take the uh, uh, area somewhere around Duluth, Minnesota, and take the border, which is now horizontal, and rotate it 45 degrees. <laughs> I, I, I know that's a little bit wild, but the point is that would, everybody on both sides would be happier. <laughs> But no, when you come and you make a flat statement of what would I personally do in the event that I felt that my rights were being violated, I can't answer that question because it's incriminating. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Cooper, you're an expert in, uh, in the personal will to resist, uh, but I happen to know you're also quite a historian. Can you give us a... Uh, a little historical barometer of where we are nationally in our will to resist compared to what other countries have done in the past? Looks bad. Looks bad. I, uh, I, I'm firmly convinced, and I think it's incontrovertible, that a population cannot be tyrannized unless it wills to be. Can't do it. On the other hand, what happens if it doesn't care? Is it true that the American people at this point are totally apathetic and simply don't give a damn? I see evidence of that. So you read and you look and you watch and you hear and you listen and you get the impression that all your so-called average man is interested in his baseball scores. He doesn't give a tinker's damn about his liberty. I hope that's wrong, but the situation doesn't look as good as we'd like. Of course, this varies from, from place to place. And uh, you'll find that it's totally different in the South from what it is in the Northeast. And uh, again, different in the uh, Southwest from, from the Northwest. So uh, the situation is uh, oppressive, but uh, we can't give up on that account. What's your judgment, uh, to answer the other gentleman's question, what's your judgment on the statement? Better to have a jury of 12 than six, pol than six pole bearers. <laughs> well, that's what they keep saying. <laughs> the, uh, the statement is, I'd rather be, uh, what is it, uh, uh, tw tried by 12 than carried by six? Um, again, it's, you can't make things black and white. You can't say that if I had taken step A, I'd... I would have been killed, and if I did took B, I'd be alive. These things are very are too much varied, but of course, get to the point where you say uh, you're going to worry about what the court's going to do. That is something you can't allow to distract you when the flag flies. Yet back to that whole point I started on today is what do you do in, in, in a condition of violent, lethal threat? Well, one of the things you cannot worry about is what a court's going to do. You worry about that before or after the act, but not at the time. If you allow concern for liability, concern for police action, concern for legality to interfere with your concentration on that front site, you'll get shot. So you pay attention to what you have to do when you're using your firearm and then worry about it afterwards. Sir. Uh, you, you were concerned about the police officers not being well trained and missing their targets. Uh, I'm concerned about the the ADF and the FBI uh, and their extended power over the states. But uh, in Sacramento, we had uh, a situation where uh, the ADF guys in their own office were playing a sort of a Russian roulette. And that's when one man got shot and killed. And the uh, BATF agent was eventually tried, and I think it was involuntary manslaughter. But he was relieved from duty and given two years in prison. And I was talking to Neil Knox about that, and he said, it's very common. And it made me think a little bit, maybe you have some ideas. I suddenly believe in gun control that applies only to federal laws. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a, got a point there. You know, uh, there are a couple of points you raise. First, I'd like to say I hope I didn't give the impression that police officers are improperly trained. 
I have a notion that a lot of them are well trained. It's not a question of they're not being able to hit a target. It's a question of not being able psychologically to take that step. <coughs> and that is another matter. But then this quick question of, of what we do about, um, about the uh, level in BATF. Well, I speak treason here when I say that I think everybody in the room knows that the dregs of the Federal Service is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. They're the people that nobody else will take. And uh, uh, I know that would cause uh, riotous oppression here and there, but they are uh, not the kind of people you want to have around your house. <laughs> He's the kind of you know, like the, the girl who decided that in order to make herself important in a uh, arms race, she stamped the kitten to death. This is a good technique, huh? Uh, well, we're getting <laughs> into an area which uh, is, uh, as I say, touchy. But I would say that the first, my first suggestion would be abolish the BATF. As I said in my most recent commentary, I don't know anything that the BATF does which needs doing. And on the other hand, I know a lot that it does which doesn't need doing. And the sooner we could get, get those people back on the street, the better. But remember, we've got this enormous bureaucracy all on the payroll, and if we suddenly started abolishing services, we'd have this unemployment problem. <laughs> and, and these people couldn't do anything else. They're not up to it. Constitution, as I understand it, says that citizens have the right to keep and bear arms. But my understanding of citizen means everybody who's over 21 or perhaps 18, depending on the state. Uh, do you agree that kids under 18 years of age should have any rights to guns, and what should be done to get guns out of the hands of the kids, especially the bad guys who are committing about half of their end of violence and a large amount of the criminal violence? Yeah, a couple points here. One is uh, uh, what the Constitution says, who is the militiaman? And I think we all know, uh, James Mason said, who is the militia? Everybody in the country with the exception of a couple of federal agents. So when we say, are you in the militia? Yes, I sure am. And well, that's not in the Constitution, but in the writings of the Founding Fathers, every able-bodied male, sorry ladies, is considered a member of the militia. Uh, that's point one, but when we talk about age, uh, we get into an area which, in which we can debate, huh? I don't know why a man is any smarter at 21 than he is at 18. And I don't know that, he, that that's going to be determined by passing a rule. Uh, I don't think that a man on his 21st birthday is automatically now able to cast a vote which affects the future of the United States when he couldn't yesterday. Um, there are probably other things involved here. When I used to teach uh, American government at the junior college and high school level, I used to put that out as a question. What should be the qualification for voting? Is it, is it legal to say that a man can't, uh, uh, can't vote till he's 21, but, he, uh, <clears throat> but he, uh, uh, he can't get a drink when he's uh, 18? He can go fight, but he can't vote. Uh, aren't we a little crossed up here? In any case, we'd li I'd ask the students over a, a, a weekend period, give me a list of qualifications and what do you think should be the issue? Now, getting back to the question here, should a youngster of 18 uh, be uh, allowed to have a gun? I think that's up to his family. But of course, if they haven't got any families, we've got this sociological problem, don't we? In a well-organized family, a youngster is introduced to firearms at 10, 12, 14. But that's a well-organized family. And how many of those do we have? Uh, I'd like to think they were all that way, but clearly we, they aren't all that way. But I would like to put it on the issue rather of behavior than on age. I mean, you talk about these punk kids are running around the street. If they're punk kids, I don't care how old they are, they're still punk kids. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not me, Parker. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for seeing